Since the first century BC, the Romans and the Parthians had waged a number of wars that lasted for centuries. In fact, these military campaigns even outlasted the empires themselves. Both the Roman and Parthian Empire reformed and were replaced by the Byzantine and Sassanid empires, respectively. These two new superpowers continued their territorial disputes and military confrontations for centuries. But the Sassanids and the Byzantines also had various proxy wars in which they attempted to start rebellions in the opponent's holdings. One example of this was the Byzantine client state, the Hashanids, and the Sassanid client state, the Lachmids. These client states served as a buffer zone against the southern Arab raiders, and both these countries were Arab in origin. But the Hassanids were Christian Arabs, whereas the Lachamids aimed to unite all the Arabs under one kingdom. In fact, Imru al Gaish, ruler of the Lachamids, claimed the title of King of all Arabs. This vision of Arab unity would not be realized for centuries until the rise of Islam and the consolidation of the Rashidun Khalifat in 632. Once the Khalifat was established, the Lachamids were quick to join their Arab brethren. But this made the Sassanids very anxious because they had just lost their buffer zone and client state. And so the Sassanid rulers decided to stir up rebellions in the region. This provocation led to the declaration of a jihad against the Sassanid Persian Empire by Khalif Umar. At the time this seemed like an ant declaring war against a lion. And this is how the Persians mistakenly perceived it. Before declaring a jihad against the Persians, the Khalif had studied the Persian history their military, their religion, Zoroastrianism, the leading commanders had studied world maps and had considered which geographic layout required what kind of strategy. They had calculated the flow of resources and located the logistical routes. Basically, the Khalifat commanders understood where to strike and choke their Persian opponents. And equally important, they understood where to avoid the Persians. This was contrary to how the Persians prepared for war. The Persian commanders looked down on the Arabs, and they viewed the Sassanid army as invincible. After all, they had much better equipment and a larger manpower. They had more experience, more resources, they had veteran commanders, and they had battled the Byzantine Empire to a standstill. What they failed to take into account was that their country was unprepared for a new military campaign. At the time, the Persian Empire was still recovering from the devastating war with the Byzantines, which ended in 628, and the Sassanids were further weakened by economic decline, heavy taxation, religious unrest, etc. Plus, the Sassanid Emperor was only 8 years when he ascended to the throne in 632. And with such a young emperor, there was a lot of internal rivalry between the other royal candidates. So in all their glory and pride, the Sassanids had completely underestimated the Arabs and overestimated themselves. When the Jihad was declared, the Khalif Umar gave his best general the task of conquering Tisfun the capital of the Sassanid Empire, which was located in Mesopotamia. General Khalid ibn al-Walid entered the Persian Empire with just 18,000 troops. And despite being heavily outnumbered, Khalid managed to gain a number of decisive victories that left the Persian army crippled. Now, Khalid was a general that performed best when outnumbered. One of his strategies was the use of deception. He would completely rearrange the position of his troops at night and equip those troops with new banners. He would also order his cavalry to retreat behind hills or in forests and when the fighting would continue the next day, the troops would march from a distance and the cavalry would run in circles raising as much dust as they could. And this all gave the impression that Arab reinforcements were coming and it demoralized the Persian troops and in some cases even routed entire armies. General Khalid managed to outmaneuver his Persian opponents on every turn. Khalid was able to quickly conquer most of Mesopotamia. In just one year, the Arabs had conquered something that the Byzantines could not manage for centuries. And before Khalid could lay siege to the Sassanid capital, 
Umar ordered him to transfer to the Byzantine front in Syria. This gave the Sassanids some time to recover and they regained control over the lost lands. But it didn't last long. Three years later the Arabs returned with an even larger army. The new Arab general to the Persian front, Sa'id ibn Abi Gawaz, led an army of 30,000 troops. And the first battle between the Arabs and the Persians was also the most decisive. In 636, a Persian army of between 60,000 and 100,000 soldiers encamped at the town of Hadisya and blocked any further entrance into Mesopotamia. The Persians had gathered their greatest generals, backed by heavy cavalry and even war elephants. Only a bridge and a river separated the two armies. But they did not instantly clash with each other. Instead, both sides sent emissaries trying to convince the other to leave. These negotiations lasted for three days. In one instance, the Persian general Rustam Farouzad told the Arab emissary an anecdote. He said that the Arabs were like a mouse that sneaked into the granary through a hole in the wall and that the mouse ate until he could eat no more. Then the mouse tried to go home, but he had grown too fat to fit back through the hole. His greed trapped him in the granary and the cat killed him. This went back and forth a few times and despite his own greedy mouse anecdote, Rustam made the mistake of crossing the river first. This strategy gave no room for any kind of withdrawal. And so when his forces were backed against the river, thousands of Persian soldiers tried to swim the river in heavy armor and drowned. This was one of the most important decisive turning points in history. After Hadisya, the Arabs took the Sassanid capital Tisfun and then just kept on marching throughout Mesopotamia. And a mere two years later, the Caliphate had conquered what is now Iraq and driven the Persians into the Zagros mountains. Now the Arab rulers did not really want to further pursue the Persians into Iran. In fact, the Khalif Umar famously said that he actually wished there was a mountain of fire between the Arabs and Iranians, so neither could get to the other. But the Persians thought differently. Their pride had been hurt. From Persian perspective, the glory and prestige of the ancient Persian Empire was damaged and only vengeance could heal the inflicted wound. And so the Persians launched a series of raids throughout the Arab-controlled Mesopotamia. But every time the Persians launched an offensive campaign, they lost more and more of their territories in their own homelands. By 641, the Sassanid Emperor Yazgar III, who was now 17 years, regrouped and assembled a new army of about 100,000 soldiers and they prepared for the battle of the town of Nahavand. And even though the Sassanid army outnumbered the Muslim Arab army at least three times, the Arab commanders managed to encircle the Persian army and crush them. This was an enormous loss for the Persian Empire. They had been humiliated and conquered in their own homelands by a relative smaller opponent. Equally important, the Sassanids had lost all their great marshals and there was no way to assemble a new army Realizing the dissolution of his country, the Sassanid Emperor fled to the Far East. This marked the end of the 400-year-old Sassanid dynasty. And with the Iranian mountains breached, there was no way of halting the Muslim armies. In just two years, most of Persia, including the core provinces of Azerbaijan, Isfahan, Fars, were all conquered. What is interesting with the Islamic conquest of Persia isn't just the military confrontations, but the mass conversion from Zoroastrianism to Islam. Despite what many nationalists claim, there was no genocide. People weren't killed by the millions, and the Iranians weren't taxed to death. Iranians embraced Islam because Zoroastrianism wasn't an organized religion as Islam or Christianity. The number of Zoroastrian temples was very limited for such a large country. Plus, the guidelines were not clear. Basically, Zoroastrianism was more like a philosophy and resembled spirituality rather than religion. One that was practiced by the elite of the country whilst being neglected by the majority of the population. One more important factor is that Zoroastrianism wasn't all that different from Islam. Both were monotheistic religions and both had this universal balance between good and evil, between light and darkness. 
This was a concept the Iranians understood in Zoroastrianism, and when the Quran was translated into Persian, the Iranians saw a familiar religion, one that was more accessible than Zoroastrianism. Today, the conquest of Persia is viewed by Iranians both as a blessing as well as a curse. A blessing because it brought Islam, and a curse because their homeland was invaded and the very core of their identity was altered. The Islamic conquest of Persia also explains the background of Arab-Iranian animosity which still continues today. One more side note, the rules of war dictate to acquire as much as intel as possible, and not just about your opponent, but your own army as well. The saying goes that if you know your enemy and know yourself, you have already won the battle. If you know yourself but not the enemy, for every victory you will suffer a defeat. If you know neither yourself nor your enemy, you will lose every battle. And this is where the Sassanids made their biggest mistake. Their pride blinded them to the reality of the situation. They failed to see that their empire was broken from the inside and they completely underestimated their opponent. This was a Caspian report by me Shirvan, so take care and so